William Miller had begun a movement that became known as the Adventist Movement, or Millerite Movement, around the early, mid-1800s, and predicted the return of Christ visibly on three occasions during the year 1844. After this disappointment, the group split up into several new movements. Two of those are known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Advent Christian Church. In 1871, Nelson H. Barber, who had previously been associated with the Millerites, published his view on the matter stating that Christ would return visibly in 1873. When this failed, he pushed the date to 1874. When Christ failed to appear once more, instead of admitting his error, he began teaching that his return had been invisible. He purportedly based his new conclusion on his findings in Benjamin Wilson's The Emphatic Diaglot Translation of the New Testament. Noticing in it that at Matthew 24, the word the King James Version rendered coming is translated presence. Charles Taze Russell was born on February 16, 1852, in Old Allegheny, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was the second son of Joseph L. Russell and Anne Eliza Burney. He was originally raised a Presbyterian. When Russell was 16 years old and a member of the Congregational Church in 1868, he found himself losing faith. He had begun to doubt not only the church creeds and doctrines, but also God and the Bible itself. At this critical juncture, a chance encounter restored his faith and placed him under the influence of Second Adventist preacher Jonas Wendell. For some years after that, Russell continued to study scripture with and under the influence of various Adventist laymen and clergy, notably Advent Christian Church minister George W. Stetson and the Bible examiner's publisher George Storrs. From 1870, he met locally on a regular basis with a small circle of friends to discuss the Bible, and this informal study group came to regard him as their leader or pastor. In January 1876, when he was 23 years old, Russell received a copy of The Herald of the Morning, an Adventist magazine published by Nelson H. Barber of Rochester, New York. One of the distinguished features of Barber's group at that time was their belief that Christ returned invisibly in 1874, and this concept presented in the Herald captured Russell's attention. Although the idea appealed to young Charles Taze Russell, the reading public apparently refused to buy the story of an invisible second coming, with the result that Nelson H. Barber's publication, The Herald of the Morning, was failing financially. In the summer of 1876, wealthy Russell paid Barber's way to Philadelphia and met with him to discuss both beliefs and finances. Russell became the magazine's financial backer and was added to the masthead as an assistant editor. He contributed articles for publication as well as monetary gifts, and Russell's small study group likewise became affiliated with Barber's. Together, Russell and Barber jointly published Three Worlds and Harvest of This World. Russell and Barber believed and taught that Christ's invisible return in 1874 would be followed soon afterwards in the spring of 1878 by the rapture the bodily snatching away of believers to heaven. When this expected rapture failed to occur, the Herald's editor, Mr. Barber, came up with new light on this and other doctrines like the rejection of the ransom sacrifice. Russell, however, rejected some of the new ideas. Finally, Russell quit the staff of the Adventist magazine and started his own. He called it Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence and published its first issue July 1879. At this point, Charles Russell continued to view William Miller and Nelson Barber as instruments chosen by God to lead his people in the past. The formation of a distinct denomination around Russell was a gradual development. His immediate break was not with Adventism, but with the person and policies of Nelson H. Barber. Russell traveled about speaking from the pulpits of Protestant churches as well as to gatherings of his own followers. In 1879, the year of his marriage to Maria Francis Ackley, and also the year he began publishing Zion's Watchtower, Russell organized some 30 study groups or congregations scattered from Ohio to the New England coast. Each local class, or ecclesia, came to recognize him as pastor. Inevitably, Russell's increasingly divergent teachings forced his followers to separate from other church bodies and to create a denomination of their own. Beginning as he did, in a small branch of Adventism that went to the extreme of setting specific dates for the return of Christ and the rapture, Russell went farther out on a limb in 1882 by openly rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity. His earlier mentor, Nelson H. Barber, was a Trinitarian, as was the Herald of the Morning's other assistant, John H. Patton, who joined Russell in leaving Barber to start Zion's Watchtower. 
The writings of Barber and Patton that Russell had helped publish or distribute were Trinitarian in their theology. And the Watchtower itself was at first vague and noncommittal on the subject. It was only after Patton broke with him in 1882 and ceased to be listed on the masthead that Russell began writing against the doctrine of the Trinity. In 1881, William Henry Conley was the first president of Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. At that time, the operations were situated at 101 Fifth Avenue, was used until 1884. In 1884, they moved to 151 Robinson Street, earlier designated as 44 and then 40 Federal Street, Allegheny, Pennsylvania. In December 15, 1884, the society was incorporated with Charles Taze Russell as president and became the legal corporation used by the international Bible students. In 1886, Russell went on to publish a series of books called Studies in the Scriptures, in which he taught his beliefs and strange Bible chronology using pyramidology and the inch per year rule, in which he measured the interior passages of the Great Pyramid in pyramid inches to predict dates of future and past biblical events. In 1896, the Society was renamed Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. In 1889, a four-story brick building at 5860 Arch Street, Allegheny, was completed. Valued at $34,000, it was known as the Bible House. It served as the Society's headquarters for approximately 20 years. Russell also believed in phrenology, a theory which claimed to be able to determine character, personality traits, and criminality on the basis of the shape of the head by reading bumps and cavities. He claimed that at the restoration of all things, when God's kingdom would be established on the earth, people of darker skin tones would be restored to a lighter skin tone, which was originally intended by God at the creation. In 1906, he claimed to be God's mouthpiece and went as far as pretending that if he did not speak, the very stones would cry out. In 1909, the headquarters were moved to the Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York. In pre-1910 editions of the third book of his Studies in the Scripture series, Thy Kingdom Come, Russell predicted that the rapture of the church would happen in 1910. This date was also taken from the measurements of the interior passageways of the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. In 1912, he claimed that appendicitis and typhoid fever were caused by biting worms in the colon. In 1914, Russell and his associates produced a movie on the Bible history in which he added many of his strange beliefs. It was called The Photodrama of Creation and lasted up to eight hours. In only one year, nine million people around the world had viewed it. A book with the same title was also published. By the time of his death, Charles Taze Russell had traveled more than a million miles and preached more than 30,000 sermons. He had authorized works totaling some 50,000 printed pages and nearly 20 million copies of his books and booklets had been sold. Followers had been taught that Russell himself was the faithful and wise servant of Matthew 24, 45, and the Laodicean messenger, God's seventh and final spokesman to the Christian church. But by 1928, the society applied that to its leaders. They taught that the scripture was a prophecy and that by 1919, they had been chosen by Jesus over all that he hath. Since they believed Jesus was ruling the world invisibly, they claimed for themselves a position as God's channel of communication with mankind. Russell had preached that 1914 would see the end of the world as we know it. As he stated in his book, The Time is at Hand, 1914 will be the farthest limit of the rule of imperfect men. As a result, many farmers refused to plant their crops in the spring in the firm belief that the end was nigh. When 1914 failed, it was pushed forward to 1915, but the end only came for Pastor Russell when he died at the age of 64 on October 31, 1916, near Pampa, Texas, while returning to Brooklyn by train of complication caused by cystitis. He was buried at Rosemont United Cemetery, Pittsburgh. The gravesite is marked by a headstone. Nearby stands a seven-foot-tall pyramid memorial emblazoned with the cross and crown Masonic symbol erected by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of 1921. Right next to the cemetery stands a Masonic temple. His disciples, however, saw the world war then raging as reason to believe the end was still imminent. According to instructions Russell left behind, his successor to the presidency would share power with an editorial committee and with the Watchtower Corporation's board of directors, whom Russell had appointed for life.
But Vice President Joseph Franklin Judge Rutherford soon set about concentrating all organizational authority in his own hands. A skilled lawyer who had served as Russell's chief legal advisor, he combined legal prowess with what opponents undoubtedly saw as a Machiavellian approach to internal corporate politics. Thus he used a loophole in their appointment to unseat the majority of the Watchtower directors without calling a membership vote. And he even had a subordinate summon the police into the society's Brooklyn headquarters office to break up their board meeting and evict them from the premises. Faith on the March by A. H. Macmillan, page 78 through 80. In early May 1918, U.S. Attorney General Thomas Wyatt Gregory condemned the Finnish mystery as one of the most dangerous examples of propaganda, a work written in extremely religious language and distributed in enormous numbers. Warrants were issued for the arrest of Rutherford and seven other Watchtower directors who were charged under the 1917 Espionage Act of attempting to cause insubordination, disloyalty, refusal of duty in the armed forces, and obstructing the recruitment and enlistment of service of the U.S. while it was at war. On June 21st, seven of them, including Rutherford, were sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. In March 1919, the directors were released on bail after an appeals court ruled they had been wrongly convicted. To escape his prison sentence, Judge Rutherford made a deal with the government. It was agreed that Bible students should cut out pages 245 to 254 deemed offensive from the finished mystery and that society would cease printing them. After securing the headquarters complex and the sex corporate entities, Rutherford turned his attention to the rest of the organization. By gradually replacing locally elected elders with his own appointees, he managed to transform a loose collection of semi-autonomous, democratically run congregations into a tight-knit organizational machine run from his office. Some local congregations broke away, forming such Russellite splinter groups as the Chicago Bible Students, the Dawn Bible Students, the Layman's Home Ministry Movement, all of which continued to this day. Most Bible students remained under his control, and Rutherford renamed them Jehovah's Witnesses in 1931 to distinguish them from these other groups. In 1919, the Watchtower began publishing a magazine called The Golden Age, a publication filled with strange medical declarations and wild various teachings. It was renamed Consolation in 1937 and Awake in 1946. Since Jesus had lost his personality as part of the Trinity in the Godhead during the Russell era, he needed a new identity, so he became Michael the Archangel in 1920 under Rutherford. Michael had previously been taught to be the Pope of Rome in the Finnish Mystery, published in 1917. Under Rutherford's leadership, several changes were in order. Joining the armed forces became a disfellowshipping offense. The pyramid teachings, once coined God's stone witness in Egypt, became Satan's Bible. No more celebrating holidays or birthdays. Saluting the flag became idolatry. Wearing a beard became non-professional. Since the cross was a pagan object in origin, Jesus was transferred onto a stake, which is somehow not pagan, according to Jehovah's Witnesses today. Meanwhile, he shifted the sect's emphasis from the individual character development Russell had stressed to vigorous public witnessing work, distributing the society's literature from house to house. By 1927, this door-to-door -door literature distribution had become an essential activity required of all members. The literature consisted primarily of Rutherford's unremitting series of attacks against government, against prohibition, against big business, and against the Roman Catholic Church. He also forged a huge radio network and took to the airwaves, exploiting populist and anti-Catholic sentiment to draw thousands of additional converts. His vitriolic attacks, blaring from portable phonographs, carried to people's doors and from the loudspeakers of sound cars parked across from churches, also drew upon the witnesses' mob violence and government persecution in many parts of the world. Like Russell, Rutherford tried his hand at prophecy and pushed forward the fear of Armageddon hitting around the time of World War I. The period of 1918 to 1920 was first advanced. Later on, he predicted that the biblical patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others, would be resurrected in 1925 to rule as princes over the earth. They failed to show up, of course, but he held on to his story, and in 1929, the society built a mansion called Beth Sarim to house the resurrected prophets, who were expected to arrive soon. When the resurrected prophets did not show, Judge Rutherford moved in. The Great Depression hit hard, but Rutherford lived like a king as he summered in Europe and wintered at Beth Sarim. 
He also owned two luxury Cadillacs. During the early 1930s, Rutherford began claiming that the Holy Spirit had been removed and that God gave him inspiration for the writing of the Watchtower publications directly to his mind through angels. From 1931 until 1952, all vaccinations were banned as being in violation of God's everlasting covenant with Abraham. In 1935, the Society presented some new light and taught that 1935, not 1881 as Russell had taught, marked the final year one could become a part of the elect class of anointed Christians who had a heavenly hope. So two destinies were invented. The great crowd or great company, coined John Adebs, were to spend eternity on a paradise earth while the remnant, the 144,000 or little flock, were to go to heaven and rule with Christ over the great crowd. In 1935, the title Kingdom Halls was given to the many assemblies of Jehovah's Witnesses. Rutherford also taught that World War II would see the coming of Armageddon, but refrained from being too specific this time. He published a book called Children, in which he encouraged witnesses to put off marriage and childbearing until after Armageddon. Many Jehovah's Witnesses remained childless and bitter until their death because of this false prophecy. Rutherford kept on preaching the soon return of the princes until his death at Bethsarim on January 8, 1942 at the age of 72, due to kidney failure caused by a cancer of the rectum. Vice President Nathan Homer Knorr inherited the presidency upon Rutherford's death in 1942, but left doctrinal matters largely in the hands of Frederick W. Franz, who joined the sect under Russell and had been serving at Brooklyn headquarters since 1920. Lacking the personal magnetism and charisma of Russell and Rutherford, Knorr focused followers' devotion on the mother organization rather than on himself. During the 1940s, the Society explained that all of the prophecies in Matthew 24 and 25 would take place within a single generation, when the generations passed away in shame after stretching it up to five decades until 1995, the society changed the meaning of the generation several times to eventually mean an overlap of generations in the hopes of escaping from another blatant false prophecy. In 1942, they obtained the rights to publish the King James Version and in 1944, the American Standard Version. In 1943, the invisible presence of Jesus was officially changed from 1874 to 1914. Also in 1943, the Watchtower inaugurated the Gilead School in New York State to train their missionaries. A superb administrator, nor initiated training programs to transform members into effective recruiters. Instead of carrying a portable phonograph from house to house, the average Jehovah's Witness began receiving instruction on how to speak pervasively. In 1945, the Watchtower officially began the worldwide genocide of its own people by banning blood transfusions and blood products, and in 1961 made it a disfellowshipping offense, causing the death of many thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses. In 1950, the Watchtower published its own version of the Bible, the New World Translation, in which they refused to reveal the names of the translating committee, stating that they did not desire to take any merit for their work. Strangely, the new translation seemed to accommodate their peculiar doctrines, which could not be found previously in the scriptures. Also, the only New Testament found that had similar views to theirs was that of Johannes Grieber's translation, a spiritist. In 1962, the organization began quoting from Grieber's New Testament for support of their strange doctrines, but they were exposed in the early 80s by counter-cult movements for quoting from a spiritist. From 1967 until 1980, the Watchtower banned all organ transplants, causing the deaths of many more members. Meanwhile, Fred Franz worked behind the scenes to restore faith in the sect's chronological calculations, a subject largely ignored following Rutherford's prophetic failure in 1925. During the 1960s, the Society's publications began pointing to the year 1975 as the likely time for Armageddon and the end of the world. In 1974, daring Jehovah's Witnesses who had sold their homes and businesses donated the money to the Society were paraded on the platforms of Kingdom Halls. Noor's training programs for proselytizing, plus Franz's apocalyptic projections for 1975, combined to produce rapid growth in membership, the annual rate of increase peaking at 13.5% in 1974. All of this pushed meeting attendance at Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Halls from around 100,000 in 1941 to just under 5 million in 1975. 
During the 1970s, changes took place at Watchtower headquarters in regard to presidential power. First, it became accepted in theory that the Christian congregation should not be under one-man rule, but rather should be governed by a body similar to the Twelve Apostles. The seven-member board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania had previously been portrayed as fulfilling this role, but in 1971, an expanded governing body was created with a total of 11 members, including the seven directors. The aim was to demonstrate that the leadership derived authority from an apostolic source, rather than from Pennsylvania corporate law. This new governing body was displayed as further evidence of the sect's being one true church with carefully styled artwork in the Watchtower depicting the apostles as a governing body. After Knorr's death in 1977, Franz inherited an organization troubled by discontent over the obvious failure of his prophecies of the world's end in the autumn of 1975. Even at Brooklyn headquarters, little groups meeting privately for Bible study were beginning to question not only the 1914-based chronology that produced the 1975 deadline, but also the related teaching that the heavenly calling of believers ended in 1935. The hitherto fast-growing sect actually began losing members for the first time in decades, as people who had expected Armageddon in 1975 became disillusioned. When membership loss grew into the hundreds of thousands, a fact masked by new conversions in figures released by the society, President Franz and the conservative majority on the governing body took action. In the spring of 1980, they initiated a crackdown on dissidents, breaking up the independent Bible study groups at headquarters and forming judicial committees to have those seen as ringleaders put on trial for disloyalty and apostasy. By the time this purge culminated in the forced resignation and subsequent excommunication of the president's nephew and fellow governing body member, Raymond V. Franz, a siege mentally took hold on the worldwide organization. Even witnesses who left quietly and voluntarily for personal reasons were denounced as disloyal and were ordered shunned, former friends forbidden to say as much as a simple hello to them. Thus, although Frederick W. Franz served as the sect's chief theologian for some 50 years, from the start of Norris presidency in 1942 until his own death on September 22, 1992, the fact that he outlived his failed prophecies by more than 15 years required him to impose a mini-inquisition on the membership in order to keep his doctrinal and chronological framework in force for the remainder of his lifetime. As for the explanation for the failure of the 1975 date, they simply accused former members of starting and spreading the rumors. In 1985, the baptism questions were changed by the leadership. Rather than follow the biblical example of confession to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit prior to baptism, a witness must now prove they intricately know Watchtower doctrine and law, and then devote themselves to a man-made organization. Milton G. Henschel's selection as fifth Watchtower president on December 30, 1992, is truly significant for the 13 million now attending Kingdom Halls. At first glance, the choice of a staunch conservative for the post may seem to guarantee a continuation of the status quo, but a closer look reveals this appointment and the conservative old guard's last stand, an indication that radical changes in the sect's leadership and doctrines were imminent. At age 72, Henschel became the second youngest member of the governing body, and he was selected to lead by men several years older than he was. Henschel was no doubt chosen in part due to his having vitality the others lacked. Obviously, these aging leaders would not be able to hold their reins of power much longer. The men who shared in building the watchtower into what it is today would soon leave it behind for others to run. Adams became president of the Watchtower Society after governing body member Milton G. Henschel stepped down from the position in 2000. By 2010, the governing body was now down to seven members. In 2012, the decision was made to enlist a new member who was born in 1965, Douglas M. Sanderson. In the past few decades, many allegations of child abuse and pedophilia were claimed against the Watchtower Society before the courts, with more and more victories by the victims against their former religion. As the internet grows, the many schemes, lies, and manipulations of the Watchtower organization are being exposed on YouTube, Facebook, blogs, and websites in general. Many prisoners are being freed from the clutches of this fraudulent religion that claims to be Christian and has been ruining the lives of millions of individuals around the globe with its propaganda techniques and goal of gaining power and fortune. For over a century, this evil organization with its corrupt leaders have broken apart and destroyed entire families. 
deceived many into false hopes of a fabricated paradise, brought many to insanity and suicide, caused others to die out of refusal of medical treatments that would have otherwise saved their lives, destroyed the lives of children by protecting pedophiles in their ranks, ruined many financially by prophesying false dates for the end of the world, then accusing them for spreading false rumors, used fear tactics of eternal destruction by God to bring many to slave for a man-made organization, caused useless persecution and imprisonment of its members by imposing useless rules and dictates and discouraging higher education. All this while turning them away from the true hope that is presented in the Bible through Christ Jesus alone. Who knows how long this organization will continue on its destructive path until its final demise, hopefully sooner than later.